welcome to Actual Spinster. Today I'm going to do my March and April reading wrap up. I think I read nine books in each month which does mean I have a lot of books to talk about and hopefully this video isn't too long but yeah I don't know if it is quite long I might change my plan about doing a wrap up every two months. So yeah we'll see like let me know it's just because because I'm doing this TBR jar project I thought it would be kind of boring to just like post my TBR jar like wrap up and then my overall month wrap up every month but anyway I don't know if it's working just let me know your thoughts so I started off by reading Somebody Loves You by Mona Arshi which was I think it was Mm -hmm. I think it might have been shortlisted for the Republic of Consciousness Prize. I listened to it on audio and it's actually read by the author and it tells the story of Ruby who is mute. So one of the kind of tensions in the book is about like communication and spoken versus felt ways of yeah communicating like language like almost being displaced from the language or like the world that you inhabit through language I'm not entirely sure how comfortable I felt with like the representation of like non-verbal nurse I guess but yeah like it was an interesting book and it, it did feel quite a lot like a kind of paradise rot Yeni Val sort of very intense imagery and like quite body horror-y and the boundaries between bodies and non bodies is not as like tight as normal and there was a, a scene at the beginning that ha I really liked and it was about like birds these birds like flying out of someone's mouth I think and like that really felt very evocative and also very like paradise rotten stuff so I definitely would re recommend it for people who like that book it didn't like blow me away or anything but I thought it was like an interesting book to read. Next I read Bring Up the Bodies by Hilary Mantel and I'm not going to talk about like my experience with it at all just because like she recently said some stuff like defending JK Rowling in a interview and I'll, I'll leave the link interview down below if you want to read her completely inane and just out touch thoughts. Yeah I won't be like reading or publicly talking about her work anymore or anything. Next I read a book that I talked about in my 1930s reading vlog and that's All Passion Spent by Vita Sackle West which is about this older woman called Lady Slane. Her husband has just died, she's like in her 80s, I think 88. So she's now a widow, she has like five kids and she's just like I don't want to be living life in the way I was, I don't want to be around them anymore. They're all like 60 plus or whatever. And then she leaves to go to like a nice house in Hampstead and she makes like a new kind of new relationships with people but she also kind of discovers like an old relationship with the person. And yeah it's just about like aging and youth and like your life and your dreams and following them through or not and like what that does to you. But like not necessarily in like a really sad bitter way just in a kind of like especially for women like just in a kind of like I guess where you just accept that your life is a particular way. But the main character also was literally like the Viserine, don't know how to pronounce that, but like of India. So she's like extremely wealthy and was previously a literal colonial. I mean she wasn't the Viceroy I guess but like you know that's like colonialism's ground zero or whatever they say of India not necessarily the entire world or anything but like you know I, I wouldn't really recommend it for that you know like mm. next I read Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell which I have spoken about and actually I am going to get rid of so I won't own it anymore and this is about Agnes Shakespeare who was the wife of William Shakespeare. I did talk about this in my TBR jar video so I won't go into depth here but basically like was underwhelmed. Everybody was talking about this like it was going to be incredible and like it was fine and it was sad and it did make me cry and it was like about grief but it wasn't really any more than that I felt and that's okay it's just it's not how people represented it to me to be. I would totally disagree that this book isn't about Shakespeare like William Shakespeare because it, it is. He affects how the plot happens. Yeah but there's some nice like imagery in here. Next I read The Empress of Salt and Fortune which is the book that is first in this series that I read February whenever I read it by Nevo. So it's called like The Singing Hills Cycle I think and there's more. There's another one coming out this year. The same main character was in that one as in this one but it didn't really matter to me because they're mostly kind of like records of like oral history collection I guess. So like this one focused on this woman who had like helped an empress and she told the story of her life and court intrigue and stuff like that. And yeah like it wasn't as enjoyable as that first one I did much, or well, the second one in the series but the first one that I read I enjoyed that much more but it was interesting and I'm gonna keep reading the series like it's fun. The next book I read was That's Love by Leonora Brito which I also spoke about in my TBR jar game wrap up video. That's a short story collection and yeah like I haven't really thought about about it really since I read it which I do think speaks to how it didn't it just didn't quite like get it I, I'm a bit sad that it didn't like 
stay with me very much but I guess that is just like what happens when you read books I guess. <laughs> the next book I read was a reread and that was The Passion by Jeanette Winterson. Yeah I just kind of wanted to see like if I still loved it because I think I gave this five stars when I first read it and I really loved Jeanette Winterson. It was like maybe the second of her books that I read and you know I just fell in love a lot with her. It's uh, this like historical fiction kind of fabulous story with two centre points. One is like Henri who is a soldier in Napoleon's army in the 18... I don't know, 1810s? 1800s? And then the second kind of centre point is a character called Villanelle who's obviously the best character and she's like a big dyke and she's from Venice and yeah you kind of get told at the very beginning that she has like webbed feet or like that there's this idea that like boatmen of Venice have web feet and she was the daughter of her father who, who had that and then she has these web feet so she's obviously already this like gender gender non-conforming character you could read her as like kind of intersex in a way and I do think that that's something that I find really charming about especially Jeanette Winterson's like earlier work is that it has like a really deep like allegiance to gender non-conformity like dykehood yeah I don't know any of any of those things like and I really like that but I think that the actual representation is often not particularly like sensitive or thought through. I mean I, I don't think there's anything wrong with Villanelle's representation although I do think that representation of like non-normative bodies in the book is not great and obviously that's part of like the genre but yeah I think it's complicated so yeah like it was it was interesting to reread and I did kind of think that I would find it like less brilliant and wonderful than I had when I was 16 when I first read it next I read a tiny little book which was the first of I think it was the first thing I buddy read with Sean this year and then we buddy read another thing as well and yeah this is Miriam Karpilov who I read in February her other book that has been translated into English from the Yiddish which is Diary of a Lonely Girl or The Battle Against Free Love which I found really interesting and I really wanted to read more of her work and so yeah this also translated by Jessica Gersing published by this like gorgeous little press called Farlag who do like a bunch of different stuff but like what they say at the back is that they're an independent publisher run by a collective of translators and literature lovers. We prioritise translations from stateless and minority languages as well as the writings of exiles, immigrants and other outsiders. And yeah they have a bunch of other stuff and they have a bunch of other stuff translated from Yiddish into different languages including I think into French because I think they're based in France. I think that was really nice and me and Chan both enjoyed reading this. It does kind of like, obviously it's quite small but it does cover like quite complicated issues very quickly. It's, it's written in letters and it's about this person who was in Russia in 1904 I think is when it was set and then yeah I think that's right and it's a love story between these two letter writers one of whom is called Judith and then it's also kind of about immigration or em emigration emigrate immigrate whatever to New York because partially because of pogroms in um, in Russia and it's also kind of like the man character he's like this sort of supposed revolutionary he's richer than Judith but he's also pretty disappointing in the way that often revolutionary men are and also very much inside, although less awfully, like I would say less violently than like the men in Diary of a Lonely Girl, but still in the same kind of vein as them. Yeah, no, but it was it was really enjoyable to read. And then there's this lovely afterward by Jessica Kazane. It's called A Translator's Postface, where she talks about the process of translating it. And also she interprets the text as one about translation, which is really lovely. And I really liked that. I thought it made the book even more kind of interesting. And I, I just had not thought about that at all. And also something really lovely she says in it is that she found a translation that Miriam Kapilov did herself from the Yiddish into English in like the 50s I think but sometimes they had crossovers and you know that's really like nice to hear too. Also really made me want to read and learn more about again Russia, <laughs> Yiddish, Yiddish land, you know the Russian Empire all the, the countries that were Russia in the early 1900s but aren't Russia anymore. Yeah all interesting stuff. Then we have the last book that I read in March I think and that's The Weather House by Nan Shepherd which I did also talk about in my 1930s reading vlog so again I, I won't talk much but it's basically about Gary Forbes coming home who's a soldier to Feta Rodney and what happens when he finds out that somebody there called Louis Morgan has said that his friend David Gray they were engaged and he thinks that she's lying and it's kind of about what happens. He's also like in love with although I don't know it's kind of hard to believe that he's kind of in love with her like I don't really know what this girl called Lindsay I want to say who's like quite a lot younger than him and basically like focused on all of these women who live at the weather house and that includes Lindsay for a while because she's been behaving wildly because of her love for Gary so her parents sent her to her like relatives and she stays with them so it's like this community of women basically and then this like migrating man 
causing a lot of trouble. There are other men in it, but that is sort of the vibe. I thought it was really brilliant. Not as good as The Quarry Road, but great. I don't know, I don't know how Nan Shepard does it without being kind of like trite, but I really don't think she is trite. I think she just, she just like taps into the essence of people, but then also like place. Like placehood I think is really important in her books and that's one of the reasons why they're so vivid. And obviously place includes the people there, which also is, is part of the vividity. I think it's a really interesting book and I mean, I'm excited to reread it and I'm excited to reread The Quarry Road as well. And also to keep reading this series. Also I would say that you can read this out of order like I don't think you need to have read the quarry road but I actually think that maybe a pass in the Grampians the third one is back about Martha because I was listening to some talk and somebody said the name Martha when they were talking about it but I was trying not to listen because I didn't want spoilers so I'm not sure. Then we get on to the books that I oh my gosh this is gonna be so long <laughs> now we're on the books that I read in April. So I, I finally read my first five star book of the year in April and that was a confession with blue horses by Sophie Hardak. Yeah I've talked a little bit briefly about but not very much so I will try to talk a bit more about it here. I read most of Confession with Blue Horses in one day because my flights were delayed and then I missed another flight which meant I had to wait like five hours in the airport but I was with this great book and so it made it much better and also like it was a testament to how good the book was that I managed to read a whole bunch of it but it was just like such a joy to read it is a sad book generally but it's also I don't know it just it really did does have a lot of things that I love to read and learn about in it basically it's about this woman called Ella whose mum has died I think and she gets some of her stuff and it has like a notebook with a list and also a letter from this archive of Stasi files from the German Democratic Republic yeah because basically she like her family lived in East Berlin for like during her childhood until she was maybe like 12 or something and so it's kind of about her like trying to discover what her mum was doing contacting this archive and like what files this archive actually has and then also this isn't a spoiler but we learn very early on that like that Ella has two brothers one who's called Toby who she's still in contact with and another called Mieko who got taken was much younger than both Toby and Ella I think he was maybe like I don't know I want to say three or four sorry I don't have the book anymore but like I mean I have kept it obviously but just not here so I can't double check these things but yeah like really young and so yeah it's sort of about that search but it's also about archives it's also about what it means to witness to be a witness to violence and to like be a witness to historical violence like the responsibility that is and also the discomfort around that and then also in in a way some of the complicity of that because a lot of these records are these like investigations and these you know they're these reports from people who are whatever I can't think of the right word but it's like because a lot of the archive is about those statements from people who are like snitching on each other it means that people who are like uncovering those archives and literally piecing the files together because a lot of them were like shredded whilst the Stasi were like oh god our time is up here I guess we have to get rid of this massive paper archive we kept of all of our awful awful violent behaviours yeah so it's like the archivist becomes part of that gaze which is yeah really intense and this other perspective in the story I guess is from this guy called Aaron who is like part German and he's gone to Germany to uh, do this kind of internship at the Stasi archive and is spending his days piecing together documents and then I don't know quite the actual like the actuality of this but I do know that like I think that the government like German government have like people whose files are still there they can request to see them like people who it's about them or their family they yeah they have the right to like ask to access those and so he was kind of participating in that work sorry that was like a very long way of saying oh god my foot is dead anyway it had so many things that I love and it was about family and it was also it would take us back in time to East Berlin in the 80s and then it would come forward to Ella in the present day trying to figure out what was going on yeah and it was just really brilliant and it made me I have actually been to Berlin and I have visited there's a museum that is mentioned in the book but I have visited that museum which is about the German Demo Democratic Republic and people's treatment there and yeah I don't know obviously like I am a communist but I'm not a authoritarian <laughs> communist like I'm an anarcho-communist which means that obviously I don't know I guess I have like a particular emotional response to people who want communism even if it's not a form of communism I really want either and that's not to say that I think that the German Democratic Republic ever really got to the communism it wanted but it's that want it's that desire that is like so fertile I think and the desire for for life and the world and all people to be better and happier and healthier and have everything that they need is really beautiful and then it obviously gets really distorted 
by so many different things. So yeah, I'd really recommend the book. <laughs> and it has also made me really want to read more books specifically about East Germany. So like, if you have any recommendations, definitely let me know. Obviously, generally specifically looking for fiction books, but I might read a non-fiction book if it was, if it was like, really good. <laughs> I'll read the non-fiction you can read the fiction. Okay, yeah, sounds good. The next book I read is Ruben Sachs by Amy Levy, which I'm reading for a little vlog I'm doing, <laughs> which will probably take me 12 billion months. But this is actually Mari, so I was like, I should read this whilst I'm here with Mari. And yeah, it's from the 1880s. It's about a North London Jewish community. Is it North London? Either way, it's London. And when it came out, I know that it was like pretty controversial for Anglo Jewry, I guess, um, because of how it depicts and that, that community at that time. Um, yeah, I... It's kind of hard to like figure out how to feel about this book because it is quite like weird. Not like the the way it's told or anything, but just like the story it tells you you're kind of like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to take away from this. But obviously, you know, this was written a hundred and forty like hundred and thirty years ago. I obviously think that changes things. And and there is also this like convert character in there who is like a bit of a joke, which is kind of interesting to read. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but it, I mean, he's a man and a lot of the people in here are a joke, you know, so it's not like, mm -hmm. but it is a bit like, oh my gosh. <laughs> also, I read this preface and like, I mean, you said some bad shit about Jews, like, I mean, she was Jewish. Yeah, yeah. But like, <laughs> it's also like, this woman was obviously like very sad, which is also why I kind of, I want to read more of her work and I, I want to read more about her. There's like a biography that I'd like to read because yeah, like she died very young. I don't know. Also, I don't really know why it's called Ruben Sachs because like he's not actually really the main character. And in fact, it's funny that I read these two books close to each other and they're also both, both Jewish books and they are also both books that contain a very like, I don't know, a, I would say much more deep like woman character called Judith in them. And they're not really love stories, but they're both, they were both, both about love. They were both about disappointment. <laughs> I mean, this is very short, which is also why I'm trying not to give much plot because then I would give away the plot. Next, I reread another book, and that's Nimona, which is a graphic novel. And I reread it because I'm gonna give it away, but I was like, I'll reread it for one more time. And I still really enjoyed it. I think I maybe gave it five stars the first time and I wouldn't give it five stars this time, but it was really enjoyable. The only thing that I found is like physically it's quite hard to read because the text is written just too small. But it's a really fun story and I really love, you know, Monster Girls. I like making space for a lot of like feminine rage. So yeah, there's that. Then the next book I read was Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. I haven't heard of it. Yeah, very underrated. Nobody's talking about it. Don't know why. I mean, I gave it three and a half stars. I definitely thought it was much, much better than War and Peace. And especially the beginning, I really Really enjoyed it. I felt like it was very, it was very like embodied or it was like very sensual and I enjoyed that. It obviously is kind of about like the hypocrisies and the double standards for men and women but I don't know, a bit like Madame Bovary I just think that like these men, they create these women characters, they make them suffer in order to prove a point about how women are treated and it's like they just like love to see women suffer but they also love to be like yeah. thought of as progressive. Leo Tolstoy could have written a happier ending and it would have been fucking fine. Also like yeah, like the like function of suicide which is obviously just a great way to end a book if you like tortured a woman mm -hmm. for 800 pages and you don't really know what to do but obviously it just has to end in suicide right because these people don't have the imagination yeah i did enjoy the writing and i did also listen to an audio of maggie jill and hall gill and hall reading it and i enjoyed her voice too because i think she's quite sexy yeah, the reason why I mentioned Madame Bovary is also because of how it ends, where the central emotional core of the book, which is this woman main character, gets just put to the side and we end with a man talking and talking and talking and, you know, it becomes this like, oh, what is reality? What is life? And it's just so irrelevant. Like, I don't care what Levin thinks about life or reality, like, when life and reality contain such gendered suffering. I mean, it could have used an edit, just like War and Peace, but not to the same degree. And I was only in the latter half that I was a bit like, this is getting a bit too long. <laughs> so that was also nice to discover. I think we've only got four more books left, so... <laughs> the next book I read was The Inverts by Crystal Jeans. Jeans? Which, yeah, is one of the books that I um, wanted to really get to this year, because I, you know, it's a new release and I was really excited, I love the cover, I love how the shoes are, but I would say that this cover... <laughs> And also the synopsis kind of like suggests this book is something that it isn't. It is about these two people, Bettina and Bartholomew, yeah, but, and they are best friends and they decide to form like a lavender ma marriage and that's kind of the concept of this book because they're both gay. Yeah, and they kind of like want to do that as a way to continue to be gay and also try to live as freely as possible whilst also not being massively ostracised. 
by society. But the thing is, and, and like I guess the allure for me as well is like the 1920s, but yeah I just felt like it didn't focus enough on their friendship, like I didn't really understand why they did this, you know, you didn't get like a really strong sense of how like how much they loved and appreciated each other. So the thing is like the way the story is told is we get like a couple chapters in 1926, we get some in 1927, 28, maybe 29 and then it goes like a bit quicker so like we go from like 28 to 32 to 34 to 38 to 43 and we also start at the very beginning in the present day where there's some been some kind of like news story about what Bettina and like they found this gun or something and they think that maybe she used it so they're like you know but like that's at the point it's like in the 1990s and Bettina is like 90 years old so it, yeah we, we meet her children but it just that part, part is so irrelevant like they clearly wrote that part to get you sucked into the story but it's not at all I just I didn't care about that at all like it wasn't a mystery story it was just I don't know it was almost like doing too much and doing too little at the same time and I read this because like because like, that thing is like it's called the inverts and they don't really engage with being an invert very much and I think that's a shame because like that's really interesting and it's really fun I just think that like solidarity between dykes and fags and then also like inverts in the past is really beautiful and I thought this was gonna like explore that. And I thought it was also going to be much more interesting and much more like of a anti-biological family kind of thing and like a way to explore kinship outside of biology even if it also included them having kids which I obviously really liked but again there was like hardly any- you're also kind of told that they love their children but that's it and, and because of the way it's told in these like we go from year to year but then we also make major skips it's just not deep enough like it needs to you need to spend time with these people so yeah disappointing i mean obviously i also feel this way because like this book seems like it was made for me but then it just wasn't next i included this in my read because i thought like very intensely about this book even though i haven't like read every single page but also like there's so many like notes it's only like 140 pages but yeah i, I like dipped into this because i was writing an application this is the passion projects modernist women intimate archives unfinished lives by melanie Massier. Mickey, I'm not sure. It is what it says on the tin. I thought it was interesting, I thought it was very sweet at times, and it was also very useful. I really liked the introduction. I don't really know what to say else about it, but like, <laughs> I do feel like I read it this, this month. Next we have A Master of Gin by P. Jelly Clark, which I've also been wanting to read for a while, and is like a fairly new release. And I really really enjoyed this. So I've read like a novella that P. Jelly Clark came out with in the series The Haunting of Tramcar 15, which I actually think after reading this I might reread because I just really love this. I uh, yeah, and I've also read A Dead Gin in Cairo, which has Fatma as the main character, who's the main character in this, who I love. She's like a butch dandy, she wears like English suits, she's just very sexy, and she works for this ministry of like bizarre occurrences in Cairo in like the 1910s. This one is set in 1912. It's in this like incredible world. I guess the overall premise is that this guy called Al Jahiz, he bore a hole in the world and he and, th and that made a bunch of like magical creatures, specifically like jinn, come into this world and like it's like massively affected that and that happened in like maybe the 1800s I want to say and so as a result of that and as a result of the fact that it was in Egypt but that obviously changed like the history of like like Egypt's history and specifically you know around colonialism and like British and French control in the surrounding areas as well and obviously this is set in 1912 so that's two years before the second world war nope the first world war starts so there are some like tensions around that which we get like a glimpse of but yeah it's just like really fascinating and it's it's just so beautiful and it, it means that like there are just all of these ways that like liberation can be explored but it's not like it's a perfect world and like women especially are still like not great but I don't know I just like really love it and I, I really trust like I just yeah I guess the one major qualm for me about this book is that Fatma works with the police and I don't like the police and I don't like that and while she does think that the police are kind of silly because they are it's just I, I don't think the police are good I don't like them there's also this one particular crowd scene where the police go and they have these batons and stuff and I just didn't really like that and neither does Fatma really but like yeah I don't I don't really like reading about it it's just such an imaginative world I really I, I'm excited to read more in this world and I know there's another short story called like the angel of I can't remember but it's it's on tour.com thing so I'm gonna read that next yeah alternative history I think can be really powerful so it almost like turns back the clock in a really nice way it's just really good can you tell I've got tired after speaking for 800 minutes? Yeah. And then I got 
the other book that I buddy read with Sean from Story Time, which is Stubborn Archivist by Yara Rodriguez Fowler. Yeah, this is a book that I felt was like profoundly sad. So it's basically just about this person who is British and Brazilian and it's kind of like her sharing like fragments and snippets of her life as well as like her family's life, so like especially her Tia, Ana Paula, and we go back to like the 1990s We and then we end up in kind of 2015 but we also like dance around between those two and like 2010 and blah blah blah. And yeah, it's it's about like mothers and it's about just family relationships too and then it is about what having a kind of joint identity and like joint language or like dual language does to you or like how it makes you feel yeah and so the bit that I was beginning to explain was there was this there's like this bit where she feels like kind of at home in a plane over the ocean which I guess is quite symbolic of that feeling of like unwholeness but I don't think that this book comes to the conclusion that you're always gonna be like not at home anywhere I think it's more like subtle and interesting than that and I'm doing a bad and clunky job of exploring it. I think it's pretty simply written. It is one of those books where like I was reading it and I was like mm, this is not really what I expected and maybe I'm a bit disappointed but then once I put it down I was like oh and it stayed with me a lot and yeah I, I think it's really I think it's really clever and I think it's really well done and I think that it grows on you. And I know that Yara Rodriguez Fowler has written a, another book and I would like to read that and I think it might be queer. Yeah and th there's this really lovely bit <laughs> of like conversations about like orgasms at the end which I really enjoyed. It's just it's good. It's like a good book you know. The last book I did read in April was this like very short collection of poetry by Martha Shelley called Crossing the DMZ, which was in like 1974. There were some like written pieces in it but I mostly skipped those and in one of them there was like really intense racism so I didn't really know what to rate the collection and I read it because I read this really wonderful collection of articles, two of them, about lesbiana and archiving and Martha Shelley's poetry specifically. So I would actually recommend those much more than the actual co collection, although there were a couple poems that made me like really feel it in my lesbian heart. So yeah, but I'm just not really sure how to feel about them, but it was interesting to read. I'll leave a link to the two articles that were on Spamzine about Martha Shelley in the description box and like archiving lesbian poetry slash lesbiana in general and loss and ownership and poetry because they were good. And yeah, I think that's everything. I hope that you've had a good two reading months and I'm definitely not doing it like this again so I'll have to figure out what else I'm going to do. But I'll talk to you when I next talk to you. Bye!